Hello, thank you for joining my YouTube channel, Leadline Down. My name is Tom Neer, and I'm a professor of ecology and evolutionary biology at Yale University. I also serve as a curator of, zo of vertebrate zoology, focusing on fishes at the Yale Peabody Museum of Natural History. What I'll be doing in this channel is essentially presenting scientific talks that outline or go over publications for my research program. My research program is aimed at understanding the biodiversity of fishes and the mechanisms that produce that biodiversity. And the video I would like to uh, present today is a summary of a paper that we published about three years ago where we described a new species of darter that is entirely endemic to the state of Tennessee in the United States. Now, this darter is in the genus Persina, and it's in the subclade of Persina that we refer to as pileoma, or the log perches. Now, as I said, the paper came out a few years ago and is the product of a collaboration of a constellation of researchers, uh, Maria Correa, who was uh, under post, uh, re post undergrad researcher in the lab, uh, Jeff Simmons is a bio, uh, biologist at the Tennessee Valley Authority. Ben Keck is a research scientist, uh, curator, and uh, instructor at the University of Tennessee. Rich Harrington is a research associate in my lab here at Yale. Edgar Benavides is the lab manager. And John Michael Mollish is a field biologist at the Tennessee Valley Authority. This paper was published in the Bulletin of the Peabody Museum of Natural History. Now, some of the research in my lab is focused on this really charismatic group of fishes that are found only in Eastern North America, the darters. And there are uh, 230 described, valid, and distinct species of darters that are recognized. And by our estimates, there is probably an additional 20 or 30 species of darters that are known to science, but yet remain undescribed. So in this plot, we're looking at the number of valid and recognized species of darters. So going from zero to 250, the top line here, versus the year described, the first darter species being described in 1820 by Constantine Raffinesque. And what we see is a uh, increase in the number of valid and recognized spe darters, uh, uh, species of darters by the late 1800s, a period of which in a review of the history of darter systematics and taxonomy, Bruce Collette called the doldrum years. Uh, there was really very little progress in terms of species descriptions, uh, stretching a time about 50 years from about the turn of the 19th, 20th century to the midpoint of the 20th century. Then from that point forward, there's been a steady accumulation of darter species descriptions stretching all the way to the present day. Now, the approach we take in the lab in terms of discovering, describing, and delimiting species of darters, we think about the problem in this uh, two-axis conceptual plot. So here we could think of genetic divergence and morphological divergence. And in this conceptual plot, we could think that there are four spaces. So the first two spaces here on the bottom are comparisons morphologically that we would uh, attribute to within species comparisons. And then uh, prior to the application of molecular genetic data to species discovery and delimitation, there had to be enough morphological divergence for systematists or taxonomists to consider things good species, that is species that are uh, valid, distinct, and recognized. Now at the onset of genetic data, we have this axis of genetic divergence uh, as a tool in our consideration for operational criteria delimiting species. Now if a species, a pair of species, are morphologically very similar to each other, but are uh, genetically quite divergent. We refer to those as cryptic species. And then again, if we have substantial genetic divergence and morphological divergence, uh, essentially all systematists would have no problem in calling that comparison uh, two distinct or good species. 
Now, the different species, the criteria we're using to uh, recognize and uh, uh, delimit different species, these criteria could be realized at different stages in the process of species diversification. And so what we'll be applying today is what is called the unified general lineage concept as introduced by Kevin DeKiris, which is a modification of the evolutionary species concept introduced by uh, G.G. Simpson um, uh, during the period of uh, the, uh, the evolutionary synthesis uh, stretching from the 1930s to 1950s. So for our purposes, species are a separately evolving metapopulation lineages, and then we utilize operational criteria such as morphological, behavioral, or genetic divergence to delimit what those species are. And the idea here, a, a, a conceptual figure taken from Kevin DeCaris' 2007 paper, is the idea that the process of speciation is gradual and that these species criteria, these are criteria that taxonomists and systematists would be using to uh, discover and delimit different species, that they can arise at any part of the process of speciation, which at the end may or may not evolve reproductive isolation, but should in uh, most cases involve lineages being diagnosable from each other. Now, what we're going to be talking about today is the taxonomy and systematics of one of the most charismatic of all darters, the blotchside log perch, Persina burtoni. Now, log perches are a clade that is a monophyletic group or a common ancestor in all of its descendants of about 10 or so species. Um, uh, these log perches have a very characteristic uh, uh, extended snout here that's uh, comprised of, of thick cartilaginous tissues. And functionally, log perches use this snout to flip over stones on uh, stream substrates, that is uh, looking for uh, benthic aquatic invertebrates, uh, which uh, comprises their diet. Now, most log perches come in a kind of a tiger stripe uh, patterning. Uh, Persina burtoni, uh, the blotchside log perch, is uh, distinct relative to other log perches and having these black blotches along the side, which is not an uncommon pattern in other uh, disparately, distantly related lineages and species of Persina. Now, Persina burtoni is uh, distributed throughout the Tennessee River system with historical collections made in the Cumberland, the Duck River system, historical collections in the Upper Duck, uh, extant populations in the Lower Duck, uh, present in White Oak Creek, which is a direct tributary of the Tennessee River below where the Duck River uh, has a confluence with the Tennessee River, and then throughout uh, the lower portion and upper portion of the Tennessee River. And uh, Burtoni, Persina Burtoni has been targeted as a species of conservation concern, and it's extirpated from various places uh, in the, the, the Cumberland. It's entirely extirpated, thought to be extirpated from the Cumberland, extirpated from the Upper Duck, and other populations in the Upper uh, Tennessee River system. Now, uh, Persina Burtoni, actually has a fairly long history. In 1945, Henry Reed Fowler described it as a subspecies of Persina caprotes. Now, uh, we won't really get into why Fowler called it a subspecies versus a species. Uh, what I can tell you is that the subspecies concept is thought to be fairly antiquated and is not used very often in ichthyology. Uh, however, what's interesting about Fowler's description of Persina burtoni as a subspecies is that uh, Persina burtoni is broadly syntopic, meaning it co-occurs co with Persina caprotes, of which um, uh, Fowler uh, thought of it as a subspecies. And so uh, I think it's pretty rare for two subspecies to be uh, broadly sympatric, occurring in the same geographic area with each other. Now, the history of Persina burtoni extends actually long before Fowler's description. In a really important paper on uh, the distribution of fishes in the Upper Tennessee River system, particularly in southwestern Virginia, Edward Drinker Cope in 1868 
talks about a log perch specimen that he identifies as Persina caprodes as being, quote, of marked variety, okay? So he was uh, zeroing in on that blotch-like morphology of Persina vertini. Then David Starr Jordan also uh, look, uh, speaking in particular about specimens from the North Fork of the Holston, which is where Cope was sampling as well as the Swannanoa River in 1889, says the difference is one of color only, in that basically Persina burtoni doesn't have the tiger stripes, but has these eight blotches that's similar to other species of Persina, such as Persina maculata, the black side darter. However, uh, Jordan and Cope were just were saying that this what would be in the future described as burtoni was essentially a color variation, a pigmentation variation of Persina caprodes, the log perch. Now, Persina uh, burtoni was first collected in the Cumberland system by Kirsch in 1891. And in fact, this comprises the bulk of the extant and available specimens from the Cumberland system. These were uh, collected by Kirsch. Now, these specimens were illustrated in 1894 in a manuscript by Mokenhaus that is, uh, was pr uh, published in the American Naturalist and was looking at geographic variation in traits such as the number of lateral lines, uh, uh, number of scales along the lateral line and the number of elements in the different fins. So the number of spines in the first dorsal fin, number of rays in the second dorsal fin, et cetera. And this morphological data for these uh, specimens of what would soon, what would later be described as Persina burtoni were presented in this really interesting and important uh, a uh, scientific contribution by Mokenhaus in 1894, which was an attempt to look at geographic variation within species with regard to these traits that ichthyologists have been using since the 1820s to discover and delimit species. And in fact, these traits, these moristic traits, are still fundamentally important in the early 21st century in delimiting, discovering, and describing new species of fishes. Now, Persina burtoni was elevated from the status of subspecies as described by Henry Weed Fowler in uh, unceremoniously in 1970, uh, Bailey et al. in uh, the American Fishery Society names list, just say blotchside log perch, the species is elevated from the synonymy of Persina caprodes, meaning that it is elevated to a distinct species status and no longer considered a subspecies of Persina caprodes. And this was followed up a, uh, about 10 years later in the really important uh, collection of distribution maps, North American freshwater fishes, Jenkins and Zorok, the authors of the Persina Burtoni uh, map in that collection, uh, point out that it was elevated by Bailey in 1970, but it was Bob Jenkins and Zorok, Tim Zorok, that made the recommendation. So, by 1970 and 1980, Persina burtoni is considered a distinct species that is no longer a subspecies of Persina caprodes. Then moving forward, uh, about 26 years later, a really important study was published by Anna George and her collaborators, including Dave Neely and Rick Maiden, uh, perhaps among other authors, I don't recall offhand right now, but what, uh, uh, George et al. did was sequence mitochondrial DNA sampled from specimens throughout the range of Persina uh, burtoni. So shown here in blue is the Tennessee River system. Shown here in red is most of the Duck River system where burtoni occurs, as well as this tributary of the Tennessee White Oak Creek, the areas in gray of the Cumberland River system, and then the upper Duck River are areas where the species are thought to be extirpated. Now, as a result of the phylogenetic analysis of the mitochondrial uh, haplotypes that were sampled in this study, they resolved two strongly supported monophyletic groups, a clade consisting of all the specimens sampled from the Duck River system as well as White Oak Creek, that small tributary of the Tennessee, and another clade which contained all of the specimens that were sampled from the, the Tennessee river uh, system itself, that is the lower system, going all the way up to the upper part of the Tennessee River system. 
they refer then to the Duck River, White Oak River uh, lineage as Persinacea furtoni, meaning that essentially it's a new and undescribed species. Now, this is where we came in to uh, begin our study um, about, um, you know, 12 years later or so, is to ask, is morphological uh, variation congruent with two species that are resolved in the mitochondrial gene tree of George et al.? So in other words, these moristic traits, which have been the focus of study and log perches in a, in a fairly broad sense, at least in, uh, since the 1890s with Mokenhaus's uh, American Naturalist manuscript, um, do we find morphological variation that's consistent with the clades that are being resolved in the mitochondrial gene tree? Then the other question is, if we sampled uh, genes from the nuclear genome, would the patterns uh, resolve such that it's consistent with the two species hypothesis as presented by George et al? And then the third question is, what is the relationships of those extirpated populations? Can we make any inferences uh, based on morphology as to what the Cumberland population and that upper duck population are most closely related to. And then we also uh, carried out an effort to sequence a little bit of DNA, uh, a little bit of mitochondrial DNA, short stretch of mitochondrial DNA from the uh, specimens collected by Kirsch in 1891. So we uh, assessed variation moristic traits for 214 specimens. And we had 126 from the Tennessee River system. 22 of those specimens collected from the 1890s were available to be included in our morphological study. We had a total of 58 from the Duck and Buffalo River systems. The Buffalo is a tributary of the Lower Duck. And then we had eight from White Oak Creek, that direct tributary of the Tennessee River, which mitochondrially, those, uh, that lineage looks like it's, it's basically closely related to that we find in the Duck River system. So with our new specimens, we inferred a new mitochondrial gene tree using the uh, mitochondrial gene cytochrome B. We included data from a newly discovered population of Persina burtoni in the Elk River system in the lower Tennessee River, par lower portion of the Tennessee River system. And we included a small fragment of cytochrome B that we were able to sequence from one of Kirsch's 1891 Cumberland River uh, Persina burtoni specimens. Now we also genotyped our specimens, not the ones from the Cumberland, not the 19th century specimens, but we were able to uh, genotype uh, the majority of our specimens for eight microsatellite loci. And microsatellites are encoded in the nuclear genome. So that's what's going to give us a perspective. If we're seeing divergence of the nuclear genome, that's similar to the divergence that George et al. demonstrated in 2006. Now we're gonna to cut to the chase. We found evidence that indeed this, this uh, populations distributed in the Duck River system and White Oak Creek are a distinct species. And we gave this uh, new species the name Persina apina from the Greek word apenes, that means without dirt or clean. And it's in reference to the silt-free river substrates where the species is found. And we uh, suggested the common name, the Tennessee log perch, recognizing that Persina apina is the only log perch species that is endemic to the state of Tennessee. Now, our, we'll go through now and kind of work through the methods and results in a sense. So uh, this map shows in blue our sampling localities for Persina burtoni, and in red our sampling lo uh, localities for Persina apina. Uh, this here in the Elk River system marks that Elk River population that was discovered through the course of this study. And in the key here, you can see if uh, specimens were uh, only those that were examined for morphology, such as the open uh, 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 circles. So these upper Duck River uh, Persina apina specimens were only included in the morphological analysis whether or not uh, specimens and tissues were uh, included, uh, or if some locations had only, uh, were sampled only with tissues for genetic analyses. Now, with regard to the morphological characters, we're essentially utilizing a suite of moristic traits that have been used in 
fish and specifically garter systematics for quite a long time here. So we basically collected uh, moristic traits. These are traits that are, are, are counted with whole numbers. Uh, 11 of these traits ranging from the number of scales in the lateral line all the way to the number of lateral blotches. Remember, Persona of Bert and I having that blotch-like pigmentation. Now, in what we did is we organized the data into frequency tables. So for example, here's Persina Apina uh, and Persina Burtoni. This is a table showing the number of lateral line scales. So the way to read this table is that one specimen had 82 lateral line scales. And over here, we're showing the averages and standard deviations. And the red uh, bar encompasses all of the counts we found in the trait for Persina apina. And the blue bar uh, encloses all the counts that we found for Persina burtoni. We essentially found divergence at four, maybe three, given poor, the relationship between lateral line scales and poor lateral line scales. We found divergence in our traits with regard to lateral line scales the number of transverse scales, and the number of scale rows around the caudal peduncle. We did not find uh, substantial differences between the two species with regard to counts in thin elements. Now, what we did is looked at where do the extirpated populations fall out in our distribution of morphological traits. So looking at only transverse scale rows, all of the upper duck river specimens clearly falled out, fell out in the distribution with Persina apina. And all of the specimens from the Cumberland River collected by Kirsch in the 1890s uh, fell out in a distribution that was consistent with all of the other extant populations of Persina burtoni. Now, we uh, took the moristic trait data, that is everything except the number of uh, lateral blotches, so 10, uh, about nine traits, nine or eight traits, and we subjected it to a principal component analysis. And what we found is that what loaded most heavily on, uh, the, I'm sorry, that principal component one explained about 32%, 32.5% of the variation. And uh, essentially, scale counts loaded heavily on principal component one. And you could see this separation here among populations of Persina burtoni versus uh, populations of Persina apina. Within either species, there seems to be no clustering of populations within species. But there's a degree of overlap in the, uh, the multivariate space of these traits. However, this is, not, this is a degree of overlap that is uh, fairly common in uh, looking at principal component analyses of moristic traits like this. What we did was we also did a geographic interpolation of the moristic traits, in this case, the transverse scale rows. And what we're looking at is what's the relationship between the mean trait value and the geographic proximity to other populations. So if this was clinal variation, where we had basically essentially low counts, uh, the upper part of the Tennessee River system, and high counts in the Duck River system, we would expect that these populations here of Persina burtoni in the lower Tennessee River system to essentially have traits that are intermediate between what we find in the Duck and what we find in the upper Tennessee River system. And this would be reflected in more of a purple coloring uh, throughout uh, the, the distribution leading to a more blue coloring as we get to the lower counts in the upper Tennessee River system. But in fact, what we find is more of a bimodal distribution of these counts, where counts are consistently high with those populations identified as Persina apina, and counts are uh, low, lower with regard to populations we're delimiting as Persina burtoni. Now, we noticed in the course of our study, and that uh, this was particularly noticed, first noticed by uh, Jeff Simmons when he was photographing. Uh, field uh, collected specimens, that there is a uh, consistent difference in pigmentation between the two species. The new species, Persina apina, the blotches tend to be wider than high, and that the blotches look more like um, 
uh, I think of them as fat dashes uh, in, uh, whereas in Persina burtoni, the blotches tend to be uh, higher than wide or even, uh, or even as high as they are wide. They're more circular in shape and they're more diffuse around the edges. And so this was something that we consistently noted among our uh, field collected and full on pigmented specimens. This is not, this is not something that we attempted uh, to quantify from the museum specimens that we utilize for the moristic uh, trait uh, uh, data gathering. Now, we performed a Bayesian analysis of the mitochondrial DNA gene sequences, and we found a result that's entirely consistent with George et al., in that all of the populations of the Tennessee River system uh, resolve as a strongly supported clade, as well as all the individuals and populations sampled in the Duck River system, as well as White Oak Creek, resolved as a clade that's consistent with our delimitation of Persina pina. Interestingly, the short fragment of mitochondrial DNA that we were able to uh, sequence from Kirsch's 1891 specimen uh, did not have the ability to uh, have phylogenetic resolution within uh, the mitochondrial DNA gene tree. So here we see that 100% of the posterior trees resolve Burtoni, Apina, and the Cumberland specimen as a clade, right? However, only 88% of the gene trees resolve Burtoni as a clade, whereas 100% of the gene trees resolve Apina as a clade. Well, the difference here is that for 12% of the posterior trees, the Cumberland specimen actually resolved within what we're delimiting as Persina Burtoni. Now, that's not real strong resolution, but at least it's an indication uh, of a resolution that's consistent with our morphological um, assignment of these Cumberland populations to Persina burtoni based on the moristic traits that those specimens exhibit. Following up the phylogenetic analysis, we carried out a uh, time calibrated mitochondrial gene tree analysis with a relaxed molecular clock using specimens from all of the other uh, recognized and uh, hypothesized undescribed species of log perches. And what we find is that the divergence time between Persina pina and Persina burtoni is about 2 million years ago. And as you can see, that's quite a bit older than the divergence times for these three other pairs of log perch species that are described and uh, widely recognized as distinct and valid species. Then just to point out that in 37% of the Bayesian posterior trees, the uh, short haplotype sampled from the Cumberland River system resolved uh, as a sister lineage to the haplotype of Persina burtoni that we sampled from the Tennessee River system. Now, our analysis of microsatellite variation uh, was entirely consistent with the delimitation of, of two species, Persina apina and Persina burtoni. In a structure analysis, we found an optimal uh, number of clusters as two. And what we're looking at here is the result of the structure uh, Bayesian uh, 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 genomic assignment uh, or model. So the way to read this is every column in this plot is an actual sampled individual fish. And the model is assigning that individual to one of two different genomic clusters, two being the optimal number of clusters given our data. Now what's interesting is that some individuals in the lower Tennessee River system have a portion of their alleles that appear to be shared with that of Persina apina. And while we are not necessarily ruling out secondary contact and introgression at this time, this pattern is also entirely consistent with ancestral polymorphism, meaning that gene copies that are still around in the populations that were there prior to the speciation process. Persina burtoni had a mean number of 10.1 alleles per locus and a estimated effective population size of 19.5. 
Prosina Pina, on the other hand, had 6.25 alleles per locus and an estimated effective population size of 12.3. Now, the good work continues uh, with regard to our efforts in uh, describing uh, the biodiversity of darters. We are actively working on a number of projects uh, that actually resulted in at least one of these uh, being described to date. This Ethiospel CF zonistium is now recognized as Ethiospel cyanoprosopum. That'll be a subject of another uh, lead line down talk. And the description of Persina CF kusha, which is the bridal darter in the Etowa River system, is currently in review and hopefully published soon. So, I'll leave my contact information in uh, the description of the video. And I hope that if you have any questions, you won't hesitate to reach out. And I might even uh, address questions in a future lead line down video. Until next time, be safe, be well.